Well, there, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech My name Is Alan. So, Slanesh, the god of gaudy ass Louis Vuitton jumpsuits and pearlescent wrapped BMWs, asked us a while ago to make a video on the ecosystem of Dothomir. This is a pretty good idea because, as far as planets go, Dothomir is a pretty special and unique place. Dothomir looks like an undeveloped and relatively unremarkable world upon first glance. As a matter of fact, if you scan the planet from space, you'll find only a handful of settlements and villages scattered across its surface, supporting a population so low that this might as well be a primitive planet. At 10,460 kilometers in diameter, if you believe planets are around, this planet is a bit smaller than Earth. From space, the planet looks kind of like Mars with its reddish hue, but unlike Mars, which is mostly a dead planet after the tragic events of Doom the movie, one of the best fictional, non-fiction, autobiographic adaptations of Dwayne Johnson's life, Dathomir is vibrant and teeming with life. Mars gets its red color from oxidization of iron in its soil. This rusting kicks up small particles into the atmosphere, which gives everything a red hue. Dothomir, on the other hand, is red because of the blood-red light of its sun, Domir. Our own sun one day will also turn red once it starts running out of fuel to burn. By that time, the sun will also expand to such a size that it'll even cover our orbit. So, doesn't really matter, I guess. Dormir could also be a red dwarf star, which is quite common in the universe. Generally, older star systems are going to have reddish light, which is what gives Dothomir kind of a creepy and ancient vibe. Before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Honeygain. Honeygain is an app that you can place on your phone or PC that can generate passive income using something that most people already have their internet service. Now I'm going to be straight with you. Uh, the money you get from this app will not make you rich. It won't replace a salary, but what it can do is generate a passive income that could cover some other expenses like your internet costs or any other subscriptions you might have. How does this all work? Well, basically businesses all over the world will pay money to basically use your internet connection like a VPN node. This allows them to scan the web anonymously. Companies use this to check their own ads or protect their brand from IP thefts, or they could just need IPs for app testing before rolling out a new product. All clients who use Honeygain must go through a careful vetting process and no personal data is ever collected from the users. It's safe, it requires very little work, all you have to do is download an app and let it play in the background. You won't even notice when it's running. And then once enough traffic goes through your internet connection, you get paid out. And right now, until May 31st, if you guys use our promo code Generation Tech, all lowercase, you can get a $5 bonus towards your first payout for signing up with Honeygain. You guys can check out the link in the description below for more information, or you can check out the QR code on screen. Also, Honeygain has an awesome referral program. You can gain a thousand Honeygain credits when your referral requests their first payout. On top of that, you can get 20% lifetime bonus from their referrals as well. Plus, your friends will get a $3 bonus when using your invitation. Now, if you can get past the annoying red lights everywhere, which honestly is better than no light at all, like on Umbara, explorers have described Dothomir's varied landscape as quite beautiful. I mean, you have a wide variety of biomes from swamps, forests, savannas, and mountain ranges. And with its temperate weather and comfortable atmosphere, you'd think that this uh, planet would be a nice place to visit, but this is not your garden variety garden planet. All you have to do is look at Dothomir's nickname, the Rancor Planet, to understand why. These semi-sentient towering monstrosities, which Star Wars fans are very familiar with, were originated on this planet before being exported all over the galaxy for God knows what reason. And they're just one small piece in what is truly a horrific ecosystem. You have the Baneback Spiders, large aggressive arachnids that spit out acid. You also have gigantic bats known as chirodactyls. The ocean is also teeming with deadly life, including the creature known as the sleeper. And the animals on this planet are large and deadly and most likely force the local sentient beings to survive rather than thrive. The locals known as Dothomirians were a subspecies of the near human species, Zabrux. Dothomirians might look like us, but they typically are a lot tougher and better suited for the dangerous environment that they live in. For one, they don't mess with veggies at all. They're strictly carnivores. They also have two hearts, giving them some extra blood flow and redundancy. The horns on their head are a reminder to not mess with them. Although female Deathmorians were unique in that they didn't have horns and most had white, and blue, or gray skin instead of the usual orange, yellow, and even red that was common amongst normal Zabrex. As mentioned, the Deathmorians never created a planet-wide society. They mostly remained in small tribal clans dotted all across the landscape, 
and these clans were generally at peace with one another. Although this could very well be attributed again to the harsh conditions on the planet. I mean, why fight your own people when everything else is trying to kill you? Dathmerians typically lived in rustic villages in complete harmony with nature and their planet, practicing their own unique versions of witchcraft and forced sorcery to survive. To outsiders, this planet might seem very strange and, and primitive, especially when you consider what other planets exist in the galaxy, like Coruscant or Alderaan. But if you understand the history of this planet, you'll know that it's quite a special place. A chosen planet, if you will, by the Force itself. You see, in Legends, the Jedi Order didn't just emerge haphazardly. The cosmic force had a guiding hand in its foundation. Now, it might seem like every other Star Wars story features a Force user, but in reality, Force sensitivity was quite a rare occurrence amongst the general population. As rare as finding a ginger with a soul. That is, that is so mean. That is so mean. Why are we allowed to say these things about gingers and like no one else? Like, where is their advocacy groups? Do they just not care? Anyway, you'd be lucky to find a single Force user on a planet, let alone enough to start an order. And so before the Jedi formed as an organization, it was really difficult for groups of Force users to come together and actually exchange their thoughts and teachings and start an organization like it. Also, without proper understanding or training, individual Force users were quite often vulnerable to fall into the dark side, abusing their powers, or being abused and or feared by non-Force sensitives. Perhaps the Cosmic Force sensed this very big problem. Perhaps it was just beta testing the galaxy before and seeing what these curious sentient beings would do with this gift, a connection to the energy field that makes up every living being in the galaxy. But anyway, at one point in Legends, an unknown entity would send out a fleet of eight mighty pyramid ships known as the Thoryor. These ships would land on eight primitive planets, including Manan, Kashyyyk, Ryloth, and Dathomir. Each one of these planets were chosen because they had a local population that was already aware of the Force and interacting with it somewhat. He had warrior cultures, uh, cultures of philosophers and, and scholars, and on Dathomir, you had shamans and seers riding rancors. Now, with their precious Force-sensitive cargo secured, the Thoryor would travel to a planet in the core regions known as Tython. Being so close to the center of the galaxy, Tython was surrounded by clusters of gravitational anomalies like, you know, nebulas and, and black holes and things like that, making the Tython system very hard to reach. I like to think of this as phase two of the cosmic forces test towards sentient beings, whereas phase one was introducing force sensitivity to individuals. Phase two was creating a safe place for a bunch of force users to gather and basically develop a society of their own, unharassed from the outside world. And should they go crazy with power, they were still isolated from the rest of the galaxy thanks to Tython's location, and thus started the legendary ancient Jedi Order, the precursor of the Jedi Order we all know today, who also inadvertently started the Sith. I guess you could say that whole experiment kind of failed if you take a look at what happens in the Clone Wars with the destruction of the Jedi and then the destruction of the Sith afterwards. Dathomir's role as one of the founding planets of the Jedi is legendary now, but I still think this planet is extremely important to the Force. And if we take a closer look at some of the Dathomir clans that formed on this planet, you'll see that they kind of formed in very unique and special ways due to the powerful force presence on the planet. The Night Sisters were one of the few matriarchal societies in the galaxy. They dictated that their male counterparts, the Night Brothers, lived in isolation from them. While the Night Sisters lived a relatively free life, the Night Brothers lived in almost a military camp of sorts where they are undergoing combat training constantly to prove themselves worthy of being a breeder for the Night Sisters. Uh, it's a pretty messed up system and you gotta think like, the Death Mary Night Sisters were not physically more powerful than the Night Brothers, so how were they able to maintain this control over their male counterparts? Well, it's really through their communion and connection to the planet. You see, unlike traditional Force users who are born with Force sensitivity, most Death Mary Night Sisters didn't have access to the Force naturally, but instead were able to wield a magical ichor that flowed through the entire planet. This magical ichor served as a medium for all of the Night Sisters' powers. The magical Iker was able to enhance the power of living beings like Savage Opress and make him permanently stronger. Powerful matriarchs like Mother Talzin was even able to regrow her son Maul's legs using the Iker. The Iker could also turn Death Mary Night Sisters invisible. There are also spells that work very similar to voodoo dolls, where an individual's likeness was made into a doll form, and upon damaging the doll, the targeted individual would also experience pain. The legendary book of Sith, which was a collection of Sith writings that were uh, basically grouped together by Darth Sidious, 
broaches the subject of the Iker. Basically, the Night Sisters believe that both the Jedi and the Sith were incorrect in their interpretations of the Force. The Shamans didn't see the Force as light versus dark side. Instead, Night Sister Shamans saw the Force existing on a spirit plane, and this is where all the energy for both the living and the dead flows from. The Iker is the physical manifestation of this energy, and it's specifically strong on the planet Dathomir, where it's used for the Night Sisters' magic. For one reason or another, uh, there's really no explanation for this, the barrier between the physical realm and the spirit realm is especially thin on Dathomir, and so you have a lot of these uh, convergences, which other Force users would call a Force Nexus. This might explain why the creatures and life on Dothamir are exceptionally vibrant. You know, we as mortal beings might perceive them as dangerous, but the reality is this is just life at its fullest potential, bigger, faster, and stronger. The Night Sister reanimation ritual is another interesting example of the magical Iker's power. By preserving the bodies of former Night Sisters in burial pods, Powerful shaman were able to call spirits from the spirit plane back into the physical world as undead soldiers. Now, the Jedi and Sith would both kind of overlook the Death Mary Night Sisters because they were relatively isolated and didn't project their power to other planets. Now, Palpatine would scoff at such a weakness, and in all fairness, when the Sith finally came for the Night Sisters, their numbers were too low to really resist. But I see the Night Sisters and all of these other Death Mary uh, clans as very valuable cultures, and that's because they have a unique connection to the Force that was pretty much destroyed by the Jedi and the Sith uh, in the last few thousands of years. They are one of the most, I guess, primitive schools of the Force. A lot of their techniques, including the manipulation of flesh and the creation of creatures, otherwise known as Force Alchemy, have long been abandoned by the Jedi and the Sith, more or less. The Dathmerians, in a lot of ways, represent, I think, a pure way of you know, understanding and, and becoming a Force user. You know, we were never supposed to worship the Force and establish a dogma around it like the Jedi. It's simply so arrogant to do. We were never supposed to wield the Force as tools for conquest like the Sith and simply too chaotic. Instead, the Force was supposed to allow us to have a better understanding of how the natural world and universe works. If you take a look at guys like Qui-Gon Jinn, uh, his view on the Force was a lot more natural and instinctive, kind of like how the Night Sisters approached their connection to the Force. And if you look at the planet of Dathomir, despite its reddish, slightly evil-looking hue, it's actually a planet in perfect harmony. The Night Sisters and the various clans of Dathomir witches were caretakers of this planet. They showed great respect and admiration for the life and energy force found there. The Night Sisters erred in their way when they started sending out their own as bounty hunters and assassins in order to acquire exterior wealth. That only attracted trouble from outsiders. I mean, the Jedi visited Dathomir even during the Clone Wars and decided to leave the witches alone, but the Sith you know, they would see opportunity on the planet and try to use it as a breeding ground for fighters for their own means. And this is what led to the downfall of the Night Sisters, something that the Mountain Clans managed to prevent because of their isolation and their, you know, following of the true path of the Force. In a lot of ways, the world of Dathomir reminds me a lot of Tython. It's untamed, wild, and powerful in the Force. Therefore, the Force sensitives on the planets must maintain a careful connection to nature in order to understand it and survive. In doing so, they manage to increase their understanding of the Force naturally while also getting closer to their own planet. To me, this is the most holistic and natural way to understand the Force. Each individual can develop their own relationship and not have to join a larger organization, which almost always leads to conflict and war. Dathomir and all the other planets that the Thor Ur visited were really just gifts to the galaxy by the Force itself. I mean, these were places where people should have went to learn more about the Force. Unfortunately, with the establishment of the Jedi Order and the Sith, the galaxy lost its way, which led to thousands of years of suffering, war, and eventually the destruction of both organizations. If you think about it, the sequel era that we are now in is the first time in tens of thousands of years where no Force organization can taint the energy field and use it for their own means. And this brings about a lot of exciting opportunities. While individual Force schools are no longer around, planets like Dathomir will continue to serve as beacons in the Force for those curious about unlocking the mysteries of the galaxy.